You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is David Kushner. Thanks for joining me today for another episode of the Author Stories Podcast. I've got a fantastic guest for you today with David Kushner, one of my all-time favorite writers. Uh, I've been following his work ever since his book, Masters of Doom, came out. Uh, His new book is called The Player's Ball, and it is a fantastic story. I know you guys are really going to love it. Before we get into that, uh, remember to go to HankGarner.com to subscribe to the show. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher Radio or Spotify, YouTube, and even now on Pandora. If you listen on Pandora, you can listen to the show there now as well. Just about anywhere that you like to listen to podcasts, you can catch author stories. I'd like to thank Crystal Pico Watanabe uh, for sponsoring today's show. The Pico's House website now has a new look. Uh, She has a team of eight people who help provide services to fiction authors. Her full slate of services now include beta reading. She has expanded her beta reading team to four beta readers now. Manuscript critique, developmental editing, line editing, copy editing, proofreading. Uh, Authors can inquire about putting their books into her Book Lovers box, which is a monthly digital subscription box with a different theme each month. This is free for authors for a limited time. If you're an author, Crystal provides just about everything that you could need. She is a one-stop shop with Pico's House to help you make your book the very best it can be. Visit picoshouse.com. That's P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E. Thank you, Crystal, for faithfully sponsoring the show. I'd also like to thank my friend R.A. McCandless, who has a fantastic new series called The Constable of Aqualine. And the first book is The Clockwork Detective. This is a steampunk detective novel, uh, the beginning of a series that I am absolutely in love with. Aubrey Hartman left the Imperial battlefields with a pocket full of medals, a fearsome reputation, and a clockwork leg. The Imperium diverts her trip home to investigate the murder of a young druid in a strange town. She is ordered not only to find the killer, but prevent a full-scale war with the dreaded Fae. Meanwhile, the arrival of a sinister secret policeman threatens to dig up Aubrey's own secrets, ones that could ruin her career. It soon becomes clear that Aubrey has powerful enemies with plans to stop her before she gets started. Determined to solve the mystery, Aubrey must survive centaurs, thugs, and a monster of pure destruction. You're going to love this book, I guarantee it. It's called The Clockwork Detective by R.A. McCandless. Now stay tuned. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am excited to have David Kushner back on the show with me, one of my all-time favorite writers. Uh, David has a brand new book out called The Player's Ball, A Genius, A Con Man, and The Secret History of the Internet's Rise. And uh, guys, if you are a fan of David's work like I am, this book will hit uh, all of those notes for you. Uh, David, welcome back to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you back. Um, when we talked last time, it was episode 94, I think it is. Uh, it was. And when this show goes out, uh, this will be close to episode 650. So we've, wow. We, we've <laughs> had a, um, a little bit go- yeah, well, thanks. <laughs> we, we've had a little bit going on since then. Yeah. Uh, but I am. I'm always on the lookout for anything new uh, from you. We talked last time about uh, how you got started in journalism and the the unique flavor of journalism that that you do, and uh, kind of uh, you know you're the guy for for our generation uh, who is collecting these stories that uh, and preserving this past that we've lived through and 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 bringing out things that uh, that I know I missed along the way. Um, Tell us briefly uh, just about the new book, and and we'll come back to it just a little bit. But what was the what was the idea for uh, for the players' ball? Um, the idea was basically that you know I had I mean I've been writing about you know digital culture for 
about 20 years now. And since there's uh, been a know, digital culture. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> you know, gaming. Right. I don't even like the phrase digital culture, honestly. I don't even know what to call it anymore. But like, you know, inter- things that have computer chips in them, but they're not about the um, technology so much. They're more about, like the people. You know, I'm always attracted to characters and stories and adventures. Um, but, you know, and, and I've covered a lot of, of the just the, the 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 stories of how all this evolved over that period of time, but I felt that um, in terms of the popular consciousness, there there were two stories that bookended this idea of this new computer age. It was Apple and the rise of personal computing, you know, and then on the other end, there was Facebook and social media. Um, but I thought that there was a missing chapter and the missing chapter was, you know, what I call this kind of wild west period of the internet that happened really in the nineties, mid nineties or so early nineties. And, um, that's what I've been wanting to write about for a long time, but I was, you know, kind of a writer in search of a, of a story. Um, and I've been poking around and, you know, I mean, if you're writing a 300 page book, you've got to have people who are compelling enough to make you want to read it, uh, over that many pages. And that's not an easy thing to find. You need the right story. Um, but then eventually I came around to the story of, um, Gary Kremen and the battle over sex.com. And (laughs) and once I really started digging into it, I'm like, I thought, well, this is just the ultimate adventure um, that and in a way for the reader to ride shotgun through an era, but also, you know, it's kind of like giving the, giving you the medicine at the same time, giving you, you know, the candy because um, you know, the medicine of it is like, how did this happen? How did we get here? Like what actually, how do we get from zero to 60? Like there was a time when people were not dating online. There was a time when nobody really knew how to process a credit card online. Um, so th- that was the, those were the points those were, that I wanted to get across and, 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 you know, and educate the reader, but while also just really giving them an inter- entertaining um, ride. Yeah. Well, the, I, and I told you before we started recording that um, I read this book in one sitting. Uh, and part of that is because I remember the stuff that was going on at the time and yeah. um and 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 so you know there's a a little bit of nostalgia there um but more than anything these are compelling characters and and like you said you've got to have people that that drive that story forward and these characters are off the wall mm-hmm. um and and it's so it's so funny that um a lot of the urban legends that you that we hear, um, you know, that uh, like the adult entertainment industry is what what drives a lot of technologies. And, you know, crazy as it sounds, it, it actually bears out in this book that the credit card processing, like you mentioned, um, everything down to the the standards that we uh, now take for granted in um in, in domain names and, and right. how those things are staked out. I mean, this is this is like a, a claim jumping story uh, right. you know, from the 1800s, and it's absolutely the things that we just take for granted that are just common sense. Um, we're not that way. Uh, right. What was it that for when you first found the thread of the story? Um, it, were, were were was it difficult to get in touch with these people and to start unraveling the story? Um, well, there's two character, two primary characters, you know, one is Gary Kremen. Gary, um, is the inventor of match.com and, you know, basically the father of online dating, um, who also registered a bunch of other domains very early on, including sex.com, which he ended up later finding out had been stolen right from under him um, at a time when there really wasn't a lot of effective kind of um, jurisdiction over the internet and who owned what. Um, well, and not, not just stolen, but with forged documents. I mean, things that were right. just you, things that we would never think is okay. Yeah. You would never think so. Um, and the person who did that was Stephen Michael Cohen, who was the, the con man of, of the story and um, really sort of an evil genius genius in a lot of ways. I mean, very 
much. They had a lot in common too. The two of these guys. I mean, you know, visionaries in terms of what this technology could do. But you know, uh, Cohen was really, like I said, a, a life a lifelong grifter. I mean, he had personated judges and lawyers and ran swingers clubs and been in and out of jail and and all that. So. He also um, happened to, by the time I started writing the story, he happened to owe Gary Kremen um, somewhere probably upwards of $100 million for having stolen sex.com. And so he is uh, in Mexico currently essentially kind of hiding out from Gary because he owes him so much money. So, you know, uh, clearly he would not be eager to talk to someone like me who's about to go write a book about this. Um, so that was, but, but, you know, that, that proved to be part of the story. I mean, Gary and I got it. I got in touch with Gary early on. Gary was on board, spent a lot of time with him, you know, back and forth in Palo Alto and going with him to Grateful Dead concerts and, and, you know, just really doing what I do. Um, Steven was someone who I hounded and hounded and hounded and, you know, and then finally got a, a phone call like at midnight and, telling me that he heard I was looking for him. So, um, you know, it's, it's part of the story. Sometimes reporting a story becomes part of it. And in fact, um, the, there is a chapter in the book where I describe Gary going down to Tijuana to try to find Stephen Cohen. What I, um, and that I was with him during that part of the journey, um, you know, looking for Stephen. So it was, a, it was just a whole, this is a cat and mouse a game between these two guys. And that's what I was taking part in. Well, their, their stories are, are, are so parallel and yeah. they, they kind of mix and match throughout the book. And for a minute you, you're looking like, what is this, uh, is this Crimin or is this Cohen? Uh, because they, <laughs> they kind of diverge and then, yeah. and across and diverge and cross until, um, yeah, until the very end, really, and uh, these two guys were—it's—it's it's almost feels like they were destined to to cross paths and to 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 be together in some right. some weird way. And right. uh, and and if it, the, the crazy thing is, if it weren't for these two shady guys, mm-hmm. um, we would not possibly enjoy a lot of the things that we enjoy today and then mm-hmm. take for granted. Yeah, I mean, you know, so much came out of this. Uh, I mean, I wrote, you know, my first book, Masters of Doom, was about the guys who made Doom and Quake and um, sort of the rise of the computer game industry out of in the same period of time in the 90s. And what attracted me to that story was similar with this in that, you know, you take a game like doom, just the impact is unbelievable. Like every day it becomes more and more powerful what that game did in terms of, you know, anticipating virtual reality and just popularizing first person shooters, things like that. Um, this one to me was similar in the sense that, um, the battle over sex.com was really, uh, had far reaching impact, um, in, in ways that had nothing to do with sex or pornography, but had to do with ownership, you know, like what does it mean to own a a domain name? This, this is the case that really established that. Right. Um, that book masters of doom, uh, was, was my introduction to your work and, Mm. uh, was, is the quintessential, uh, tech biography. uh, If you want to look at it that way, I think it, um, and, and this book, feels the same way where these characters it, it reads like a novel uh mm-hmm. in that uh you know you have to keep turning the pages to know what happens e- even though we we all know the ultimate end to it uh but it's these these fascinating details along the way uh when you're interviewing these people or maybe going back through historical documents uh and and piecing the story together um how does the narrative usually come together do you start seeing that early on and then start f- chasing the narrative or do you gather up lots of information and then try to find the narrative thread through that <laughs> oh boy I, I don't know why but this just gave me uh it stimulated a, a very arcane reference i was about to make um of an old of an old japanese video game um what is it called the one where you roll the ball over stuff and you collect it do you know what oh, I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah, I do. I do. Oh my god, I'm having a brain freeze on it. <laughs> uh, this is killing me. Um, 
It'll come to me. But anyway, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like that. Like, in that game, you're like a big ball that's rolling over household objects that are all collecting to the ball. Um, that's kind of what it's like, in a way, except I'm the ball. Like, you know, I'm I'm just trying to get as much as I can. I mean, I, I'm voracious. You know, I want everything. I want to know... You know, it's if I was if I was like an archaeologist, like I'd just be out digging up everything I can on a site, and then once I have a room full of artifacts, then I just you know, start piecing it together. And um, you know, obviously that that's a subjective act. Um, you know, P, you know, you could have two writers give them all the same information; they're going to tell a completely different story. Um, so. Um, but you know, I, I knew the arc of it. I knew the beginning, middle and end, but there were just so many insane surprises along the way that, you know, um, would take me into a different direction or open up a chapter, um, of this that, that I didn't anticipate. And, you know, um, I mean, occasionally I'll, if I teach journalism, I mean, that's really what I urge is people to like the the reporting is, is what is going to reveal the story, you know, and, and you, there's no predicting where the, the, the most essential gems will, will emerge. You know, it could be, you know, often I'll talk to a, a car- I'll talk to someone who think who might, you know, they, maybe they are somewhat tangential to the story. Maybe it's a college friend of Gary Kremen's, but that, that, one person might tell me one thing that will really uh, just, you know, uh, cast a totally different light on what I'm writing about. So, you know, I mean, for example, you know, one, one, while reporting this book, um, Gary Kremen in the course of his legal discovery had gotten a copy of Stephen Cohen's hard drive. Um, And he, and he shared that with me. Um, and, uh, you know, the hard drive of everything at the time, this, their battle was going on. So I'm looking through it and, you know, again, just given who Stephen Cohen is, it, the kind of stuff that was in there, you know, I mean, just, he was writing sexual how to essays. He was designing his own like coat of arms for his family. Um, you know, there was a lot of like hackery kind of stuff on there. And then I started seeing, um, pictures of shrimp and there were pictures of, like, you know, photographs of shrimp on ice and like, you know, somebody like had a, bringing a bag of like sh- shrimp right out of the ocean and like technical information on raising shrimp. And I just, what is going on? Like, the what store? the hell is this guy into? <laughs> What's up with the shrimp? So I yeah. call up, I call up Gary and I said, Gary, you know, I said that. I said, What's up with the shrimp? And Gary said to me, uh, he's like, Oh, you found the Camarones. You know, and um, and I said, what are you talking about? He's like, ah, I own a Mexican shrimp farm. Didn't I tell you? And I said, no. So, you know, what I discovered was that, um, you know, at one point during this chase, Stephen Cohen was hiding all of the millions he had made from illegally taking sex.com so that Gary Kremen couldn't get the money. And one of the places that he uh, put his money was in a shrimp farm in uh like in the middle of cartel country in mexico so you know there were a million moments like that in in reporting this book that's insane um was that game katamari by any chance it was katamari damase yes yes that was it (laughs) that was a great game yeah yeah Yeah. absolutely we'll have to put a put a link to that in the show right um you um you mentioned you know when you start reporting a story you you're also uh, very prolific in some of these uh, kind of long form um, journalistic pieces that you do for Wired magazine, for Rolling Stone, um, Esquire. Uh, you write kind of all over the place. Um, when you start investigating a piece, um, how do you know, or, or do you know from the beginning if this is going to be one of your shorter uh, long form pieces, or if this is going to be a book? Um. You know, that's a good question. Um, often the books start in some form or another as articles, if only because I'm just finding my way. You know, with, with the player's ball, um, I was interested. I, I was kind of interested in telling the story of 
what's almost become a cliche, which is that um, that that pornography drives the internet or drove the internet. But how did that happen, and who did it? Um, so that was a road that I went down, and it manifested in different articles. But then once it, again, it's the Katamari uh, method, which is once it once it starts building enough, then you're like, well, wait a minute, this is actually way bigger than just one article or two articles or three. I can see a whole big story. Um, for me, I don't know. It's very, it's very idiosyncratic and very personal about what, what would make a book. And, um, you know, it has to have some bigger sweep, you know what I mean? Like there has to be something kind of epic, not in a portentous way, but like, well, this is about the rise of the, of the web. You know, this one's about the rise of, of computer gaming, like some bigger sweeping story. But again, you know, that's driven by um, a few characters and is, is cinematic. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in those kind of stories. So um, generally, that's how it works. I mean, there's something right now that I'm interested in been kind of going through that same process but you know it doesn't always work i mean there there have a couple there have been a couple there's some other without getting into the details but there's some other there's some other stories that are sort of along these lines but um i can't necessarily check all the boxes like maybe uh, you know there's one thing that i know about for example that I think it'd be great. It's a great book. It would be a great way to tell a specific story, but I, I'm not getting the the level of access that I would want to tell it. So, you know, there, there's things that you kind of bump up against and that's just, you just have to deal with it. All right. Um, when you were on the show last, uh, your book Alligator Candy had, uh, had just released and yeah. it was a, a, a memoir, which was, uh, Different from a lot of the other stuff that you do, because this was a, a story about about you and, and yeah. a a particular time period and a particular incident. Uh, folks can go back and listen to episode ninety five. I'll put a link to it mm -hmm. in the show notes uh, where they can catch up on that. Um, between that and and now, with uh, along with the other work that you do, you published a book called Rise of the Dungeon Master: Gary Gygax and the Creation of D and D mm -hmm. uh, in a graphic novel format. Mm -hmm. Um, what was, what was the deal with that book and how did you come to that? And what was the decision to make that a graphic novel as opposed to the other yeah. uh, stuff that you do? Yeah. Um, I mean, it was a few things like one is just that I grew up on comics, you know, I grew up on underground comics and, and mad magazine and, 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 you know, superhero comics. And I was always interested in that. And then, and I've always just kept an eye on it, on the medium and, um, you know, more recently with graphic novels evolving and, and, you know, you were, I saw an opportunity, um, which was that, uh, while there had been kind of, um, uh, autobiographical graphic novels, there haven't been a lot that take a, a, a kind of a long form journalist like myself and pairs uh, pairs someone like me up with an illustrator to create essentially uh, a nonfiction graphic novel. Um, and I was thought that wow, that's that would be fun to do. And um, I always, you know, Gary Gygax and Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, that was a story that I've for many many years. In fact, I was once writing a book about that. Actually, it was after Masters of Doom. I had a contract to write that book uh, about the hit, the story of D and D. Um, and I had Gary Gygax participation. Um, then he ended up, but in the middle of it, he got sidelined with, I believe okay, it's been a long time. I believe he had a heart attack or a stroke and called me up and just said, you know, Hey, I, uh, I'm going to be out of commission here. For I don't know how long. And, so I put it on hold and never kind of went back to it for various reasons. But then I thought, wow, this would be a great, this is perfect for a graphic novel because it deals with fantasy. It's geeky. You know what I mean? It's like people who hang out in a comic book store would probably be interested in reading about this. Um, and I had done um, a Wired magazine profile of, of Gary that, sadly turned out to be the last one because he died um, um, right before it was published. 
And there was so much material I had there that I, I thought, well, I could take all of this work I've done and, and sort of add to it and work with this artist um, to create the graphic novel. So that's how it came about. And actually, I'm working on another one right now, um, which will be similar along similar lines. Nice. Nice. Mm. Um, what is the most fun, uh, for you to work on? Uh, is it, is it a novel project? I mean, not a novel, but a, uh, a long form, uh, book. Uh, is it one of your articles? Uh, is there one that just gets you more excited or is it the subject matter that, that draws you in? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that is one thing that's a little different about me. I'm pretty agnostic about the medium, like, graphic novel, magazine article, book. I mean, now I'm doing screenwriting, you know, um, I'm writing a TV show. Like it, it doesn't, to me, it's, it's just, I guess it's probably the story and what it more than anything, it's not so much about where or how it's manifesting. Um, you know, and, uh, I mean, books are fun because there's such a long haul and you, you go so deep and it's kind of like, you know, putting on your mining hat and going into a mountain for a couple of years. Um, so, um, but then, you know, now I've come out and I'm like covered in dust and I, it's like, <laughs> I need to shower and kind of just relax for a little while. Um, so, um, but yeah, it's just, it just sort of depends. And there are some stories that just, they don't, you know, would never work as a, it would never work as a book. It's not, you know, it's, it could be a super cool and interesting um, story, but it's just not one that's necessarily you're going to want to read over 300 pages. So it's, it's, you know, at this point for me, it's become a bit intuitive, I guess, about where or how a story could, could manifest. Um, aside from the geek factor, uh, when you're telling a story like, uh, the player's ball or, uh, masters of doom, um, you are, uh, preserving uh, a bit of our uh, cultural history and uh, kind of filling in some of the gaps that inevitably get lost as we move forward with technology. Um, how important is it and, and what do you think we what do you think we lose uh, when we just keep moving forward without remembering the steps that took it that that we had to take to get where we are? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good question, too. I mean, especially with anything, you know, with any with all of the ones that we're talking about here, these particular kinds of stories that are connected to the Internet and gaming and technology like it's changing so quickly. It's insane. I mean, I once wrote a profile of a guy named Ray Kurzweil, who's a futurist, who he's the one who has this idea of the singularity, you know, that um, that that computer intelligence is going to surpass machine intelligence and we're going to upload pretty much as <laughs> like in a very crude way of describing it. Um, and you know, one of, one of Kurzweil's points is that oh, this is, this is all happening at such an exponential rate that we are, we're not even aware of it. Like, and he takes out a cell phone and he'll hold it up and say, you know, if I told you 20 years ago or how many years ago that you could have access to all of human knowledge in your pocket, you would think it was crazy. But now we're just complaining about the speed of it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 important, especially now that things are moving so fast, to take a beat and think about, well, where did this, how did this happen? Because when you understand that, I mean, hopefully, like when you look at the story of the early days of the Internet, you, you start to see patterns and you start to see, um, well, how does innovation happen? You know, like what? For, you know, a lot of my stories are also business stories, really. I mean, the player's ball is, is a business story about a guy with an idea, you know, and I, and I mean, you know, one thing that I found by taking the time to look at how did these things happen is I started to understand, um, how innovation happens in a lot of this, in the, these arenas. And, you know, one thing I've noticed is that whether we're talking about Doom, you know, the computer game or Facebook or YouTube or uh, Match.com, each one of them started with the creator making something that he wanted for himself. It was a personal idea. He wasn't contriving something that he thought necessarily millions of people would like. You know, in, in Players Ball's case, 
Gary needed a better way to date. He was he was kind of striking out with what was the the way people would date at the time in personal ads. Um, and he thought, well, I can use this this new technology um, to hook people up online. And I bet you more than just people than me would be interested in that. But it started with him, you know. So um, I don't know, a bit of a roundabout way of, of answering that, but I think that though that those that kind of payoff, that kind of insight, can only happen if you just take a beat and and really look at how did we get to this moment. What's really striking when you read the player's ball is remembering uh, just how much uh, like the Wild West the internet was in in the nineties and. Mm that there there really were no restrictions um if you could if you could put it up um that there's really nobody to to stop you um and censorship was was not something we were really thinking about at the time yeah. um and now we have stories every day where um you know people are are using platforms like Facebook and Twitter and and people are either being blocked or uh deplatformed demonetized and and all of this thing and and because we've kind of built the internet culture around these apps that we're using and these, um, and, and we're, we're losing some of that wild west nature for, for good and for ill, um, I guess. Um, what do you think about after digging into this time period and, and with these people so much? Um, what do you think about the future of, of this technology that is now maturing and, and with, you know, maturation comes all sorts of, limits. Yeah, yeah. Um well, you know, one of the reasons that I called the book The Player's Ball was because like the, the title the, the title actually the original Player's Ball was a party in Chicago in the 70s for pimps. In the um 2000s, the the people in the adult industry online uh kind of co-opted that name for their own annual party and to me, you know, why I called it The Player's Ball because I thought these were the real players of the internet at the time. But as I say, toward the end of the book, there's always another ball and there's always new players, you know, it's always happening. So I do think actually that there is always kind of a wild west somewhere. Maybe more recently you could talk about cryptocurrency as being an area where that was happening. Um, you know, so there's, there's always going to be disruption. I mean, I guess that's another way of talking about it is really disruption. I mean, um, and disruption um, it, it is going to continue to happen. Um, so while there are limits, and you're right, there are more rules, and there, all of that will be happening in some areas. In other areas, it's just going to be completely torn down and, and reinvented. So I think it just depends on where we're looking. Um, you've written about uh, id Software and in Masters of Doom. Uh, you also wrote, um, I, th I think it was called Jacked, mm -hmm. the, the story of uh, of Grand Theft Auto. Uh, and now uh, with Players Ball, uh, what do you see as as the next uh, thing that that needs to be uncovered? Do you have an idea of what you might work on next? Well, I mean, there are stories that I'm working on now. I mean, I'm now I'm doing a bunch of magazine. Pieces and like I said, I'm working in more, more and more in TV and film, and um, you know I'm kicking around some ideas that that could be a book. I mean, like a like um, you know with a book, there are certain you know I I all the time would get people suggesting that hey you should write a book about you know Minecraft or something like that or Fortnite, you know. But it, sometimes there's just nothing. There's no there there. You know what I mean? There's not. Fortnite is incredibly interesting, um, and there probably is a book to be written. But I don't know if it's necessarily the kind of book that I would do. You know, it just depends on like what I like to have those central characters. So I, I'm I'm figuring that out. But I think that in the in the digital arena, you know, there are always. Um, there, there are a few areas that, that could still be explored and there's one in particular, like not to be coy, but I'm kind of looking at it and I'm sort of in that process of putting it together. Um, speaking of, of writing magazine articles, um, how has that, uh, that media changed, um, with the, the decline of magazines and, mm -hmm. and uh, properties going more online? Uh, does that affect a journalist like you? Um, 
Well, I'm I'm a little different in that, you know, I've been doing this for a long time and so I kind of know editors at different places, but yes, I mean that 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 the industry has taken a huge hit in the sense that um there's just less pages. You know, magazines, you go to the newsstand, look how thin they are. That's because there's less advertising. If there's less advertising, less pages, there's less pages, there's less stories. So, um on the other hand, there are more outlets online that are pub- publishing long-form journalism, the kind of work that I do. Um, but um, so there is there's disruption there as well. I mean, again, like when I talk to young, if I talk to a young journalist, um, I mean, I, I I like to be optimistic because I say, well, okay, maybe there's less pages in Rolling Stone, but you know, look at all these places online that you could you could do this for, or even just do it yourself. You know, if you're really just starting out, um, you can't get anyone to, to to assign you a story, then just write it yourself and put it online and do 10 of those and then send that to a magazine. So I think there's there's more opportunity, actually, for writers um, now than there was when I was starting out. Um, but um, so I, I don't know. Like I said, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that if somebody, I, I do believe that if you've got a strong voice and you've you've got something to add and you've you know you know how to report that you're going to land somewhere. Well, I think we have to be hopeful and optimistic because if we've learned anything from the stories that you've you've told to us is that the disruption that comes along is almost always uh, priming us for something bigger and greater, and we just have to be willing to go with it. Yeah, I mean that uh, you know, just one thing I would add is that um, you know, there the, the 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 what is lost and what's a very very serious thing that's being lost is that you know, with with those bigger magazines, um you have resources that you're not going to get elsewhere. So fact checking, for example, you know, I mean, in any of the big magazines, you have teams of fact checkers, you have lawyers like um, the amount of uh, scouring that takes place creates a quality that you may not get. You're not going to get elsewhere, um, you know, without that, without that. So that is something that I think is is a slippery slope and that, um, you know, is problematic. Well, the new book, The Player's Ball, is uh, available everywhere in hard uh, hardcover, audiobook, Kindle. Um, I absolutely love what you're doing, David. Uh, it's fantastic, and we're going to be watching for uh, what comes up next. Is, is there a place online where people can read through your articles, dig into your back catalog, and, and follow along with news of what's coming up next? Sure. Um, there's my site, which is just my name, davidkushner.com, which is where I – try to put all the most recent articles and links to books and all of that. And also on Twitter is just my, you know, kind of nonsensical random postings of whatever, which is uh, just my name at David Kushner. Excellent. We're going to send everybody to see you, David. Uh, thanks so much for coming back on the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning into author stories. You can find archives of all of the shows at hankgarner.com. Now stay tuned for a special audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Hello, young one. What ghoulish tale of horror shall we explore tonight? Shall we watch The Creep Show? The Nightmare on Elm Street? Child of the Night, give me your answer. Which one would Mom kill us for watching? said Buddy. Dad grinned and his eyes grew wide. Which do you think, child of the jackal? The omen! And we might have time for omen, too, if we hurry. She'll be home by eleven. I'll be back. Buddy ran to his room. He stripped down to his Yoda underwear and fished in the closet. Two minutes later, he snuck back into the living room wearing his skeleton costume from last Halloween. He crept up behind his dad, who was cueing the movie. But David Rittermeyer was too clever for that. He spun around at the last moment and bared fang teeth torn from paper plates, drawing a yip of surprise and a cry of, No fair! Daddy kicked off his Reeboks, plopped his smelly gym socks on the coffee table, another thing that Mom would hate, and killed the lights. The scary intro music began. 
The screen showed the silhouette of a boy, about Buddy's age. His shadow was a long, creepy cross. The Antichrist, the son of the devil. Born of a jackal on a night of astrological portent, destined to bring about the end times and the final battle of good versus evil. Buddy sipped sun-kissed and scooted up next to his dad. As the movie got scarier, he slipped an arm through his father's and cupped his big bicep. Buddy could feel his father's pulse. Dads get scared, too. They flinched together, shouted together, pointed at the screen and covered their faces together. Buddy pressed his eyes to Daddy's shoulder just before the on-screen maid shouted, It's all for you, Damien! and dove from the roof, hanging herself. Buddy knew which parts he was old enough to watch and which parts he wasn't. He trusted his dad to let him know when to look again. Occasionally, his dad tricked him into peeking too soon, but that was part of the fun. They kicked their feet at the screen and shouted, Look up! Look up! Oh, idiot! Don't get yourself killed! At the climax, the hero of the movie, Mr. Thorne, discovered a birthmark of three sixes on his son's head and dragged the little antichrist to the altar of the church, determined to spear his son with holy daggers and end evil forever. After it was over, the Rittermeyer men sat silently through the credits. David put an arm around his son and ran his fingers through Buddy's hair. He wasn't searching for devil marks. He knew there weren't any. And Buddy was certain there were no daggers in his father's hand, either. Those things were just make-believe. Real fathers and sons don't do bad things to each other. They were queuing up Omen 2 when the power went out. No, Buddy whined. Not on movie night. Daddy went to the window. It's the whole block. Sorry, Damien. How about... Hmm. Scary blackout. Go get the Ouija board out of the guest room closet. Cool. And candles. Buddy found the Ouija board, hidden under old clothes. When he shut the sliding door again, the sight of a monster startled him, and he let out an involuntary, huh, sound. It was his own skeleton-bodied reflection in the mirrored closet door. He stared at it. He liked the effect of moonlight on his cheeks. Spectral, haunted, his eyes big and white. He clacked his teeth at himself, picturing his own grinning skull under his child's flesh, and gave an evil laugh. He was answered by a scream. A woman's scream. High-pitched and far away. One of the neighbors? Buddy dropped the Ouija board into a patch of moonlight and sat with it. What's going on? he whispered, his fingers on the heart-shaped wood planchette. 